Happy Easter. Got to bring my lunch with me. You never know when you're going to get caught out and you need five loaves and two fishes. It's great to be with you this evening. Nice to be back in Milton Keynes. I feel like a resident now. I've been home for three weeks. I've got some notes in case I need them. So how are you doing? Now, we had a lot of discussion in the first service about these. What are they called? What? Come and feel this. My hands are warmer. <laughs> this is not a hot cross bun. This is a not crossed bun. Um, did anybody, has anybody else had one of these tonight? There's an infiltration of paganism. <laughs> Trying to introduce a new story for Easter. The not crossed buns. You might need that later, Billy. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles, please, to John's Gospel. Chapter 19 and verse 28. When I was invited to speak tonight, I knew exactly what I was going to talk about within about 10 seconds. I want to talk and use the words of Jesus that we find in this passage up to verse 30. It is finished. And it is. Come on, cheer up. It is finished. The job is done. Let's read first, but as I come to read, let me bring you greetings. John was sharing with us the fact that he's so happy that the contributions that he and his wife make, and many of us feel the same, to the church is blessing people in the city and beyond. As the person who has the privilege most of the time to be beyond, then I want to tell you that it really is making a difference what you give, and thank you so much for doing it. And I convey to you tonight warm greetings from Uganda in East Africa. People there asked me, please say hi to the church from Albania where I was last week. And they also asked me to greet you and say thank you for all the support over the many years. And India as well. I was talking to our friends in India yesterday and they said, please greet the church. So greetings. Can I greet people back when I talk to them next? Yes. You agree? All in favor, say aye. aye. Thank you so much. <laughs> Verse 28. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, you know, in the world today, people can complicate simple things. People like to ask us, Why do you have Christmas in December? Where in the Bible does it tell us to celebrate Christmas? Why do we do what we do at Easter on Good Friday, on Easter Sunday, Easter Monday? What, what are all these things that we do about? Let's keep it simple. Let's keep it simple. The reality of our title is the reality of experience. It is finished. The job is done. Isn't it great when you complete a job? I'm one of those people, I don't go to bed and think about work. In fact, I don't go to bed and think about anything. I just sleep. And I wake up in the morning and I start work. But I'm one of those people who makes lists. Because I'm a firm believer that if I write it down, I don't need to remember it. All I have to do is remember to go there and read it. Now that's the challenge. Going there to read what I've written. But I make lists. And when I, when I make a list, I put a dash next to each item on the list. 
That dash means there's an item following the dash. When I've completed that task and given something to somebody else, I put one tick next to the dash if somebody else has taken the job. If I've taken the job and done it, I put two ticks. That means job done. If I don't do the job, I turn the dash into an arrow and I carry that item over to the next day. Does this sound complicated? <laughs> I didn't learn this from Google, as you can see. There would be a much more intelligent way, I'm sure. But one of the nice things that I like to do, it, I'm, I like to walk, by the way. They told me this new micro, I've got this new microphone. It's, it's an old fashioned one, actually, because I don't want to walk around carrying the big one. So they got a new microphone for me. They told me, don't go to the end of the platform because it will make a noise. They're lying. <laughs> they said, don't go to the ends of the platform. It will make a noise. They are lying. <laughs> now, in the first service, there was some very clever techie there who turned it up so they got feedback. But he's at least behaving himself. Otherwise, you'll get a not crossed bun. <laughs> it's a challenging thing. It's a challenging thing to know when a job is done. It's fantastic. But when the list is still there with no ticks, no pass it on to somebody else's, no completion, when the page becomes arrows. I recently wrote on Thursday, refer to Monday, <laughs> last week. That took me back to where I should have started. Finishing. Finishing a race. Any joggers here? Huh? You're a jogger? You are. Well done. Isn't it nice to finish when you go and do a marathon? Somebody was telling me the other week he, he's practicing for a marathon. He looked awful. If I looked like that, I'd go and see my doctor again. <laughs> I've got enough challenges without running a marathon. That lady who ran five marathons in, what was it, 100 miles in three days, she finished it with 99 seconds to spare. Can you imagine? If she'd want, gone one second over, she wouldn't have been the first woman to do it. But she finished, and she couldn't even talk. She was so out of breath, she couldn't speak. She just laid there on the floor. I'm like, what a great sense of achievement that is. I laid myself out by running for three days without sleep. But achievement, I'm sure she feels great. Everybody wants to talk to her now. They want to interview her. They want to get information from her, why she did it, what she did it for. She's the first woman to complete it. It's great to finish, right? Finishing an exam. Ho! Oh. Have you ever done exams? Huh? Who's still doing exams? You're still doing them. Isn't it great when you've done it? Well, not so great when you come out of the exam room and there was five questions out of six that you couldn't answer. <laughs> but at least the pressure's off. You know you've failed. <laughs> You're not waiting, wondering what the result is. You know you've failed. I was hopeless. It's finished. The job's done. A puzzle. Now, the church has introduced a puzzle for all of us. Have you collected your puzzle at the door today? You got a puzzle? Here's the puzzle. I don't want to, I don't want to be irreverent about this, but this is a puzzle. First of all, finding the little wafer. <laughs> I've been to hotels and tried to eat marmalade, but I can't find which corner comes up. And then you can't get your finger under the silver paper. And I've sat here on numerous occasions, and I wanted to become a Catholic. Because at least you walk forward and somebody's already opened it for you. <laughs> the first challenge is to open it and get the wafer out. That's the first challenge. Am I, am I talking nonsense or do other people feel like me? 
Eh? I'd rather drink out of a bucket that everybody's drunk out of and take my chances with foot and mouth disease. You with me? You with me? We, we'll, we'll sit together in one section, not cross buns and not this. Then when you've got the wafer out, you don't know whether you should eat it or wait for somebody to tell you something else. <laughs> when am I supposed to eat it? John's coming up later. Maybe he'll help us and say, now, now let's eat and drink together. Then everybody, you look around. Don't open it now. Too early. By it's, by it's, some of you need to start because it'll be late when you get there. But then you go for the, the wine. The wine. You try to open the other one. But you've got your white shirt on. Or your white coat. And you know sometimes when you open these type of things, especially if you do it on an airplane, and the yogurt goes all over your chin, and you weren't there using a spoon, you just got it straight there. Puzzles. Ever done a jigsaw puzzle? A thousand piece jigsaw puzzle? And you come to the end and you only had 999 pieces. Have you ever felt the sense of disappointment? You clean the house like the New Testament stories looking for the one that was lost. You can't find it. But what a great achievement when it's all there and you finally put the last piece into place. It's finished. <laughs> Reading a book. I got a book about Winston Churchill by Roy Jenkins. Has anybody ever read the book by Roy Jenkins about William Churchill? Because if you can, please come and tell me what it's about. It's three inches thick, and I don't know anything about Winston Churchill yet because I haven't opened the book, and I've had it five years. But finishing a book is great when you've gone into the book and you've read it and you've absorbed it. And, and when you get a book that's exciting, like Biggles, and things like that. You get a book that's exciting, you want to get to the end because you want to know what happens. It is finished. Whoa, that one's done. Let me start on the other 20 now. Renovating the house. Now, the wife's here tonight. My wife is here. So I don't want to talk again about renovation. I'm moving on quickly. <laughs> Medical, check, surgery. You've got to go for surgery. I went some years ago. I've only had one surgery in all my life. They took a ganglion off my ankle. I went to Blakelands, went to the, the most beautiful pillows that I've ever found in my life were in Blakelands Operating Theater. I laid my head back and I felt so great. But I was wondering what it was going to be like. Then it was done. And I wasn't one of those old people who died under the anesthetic. It was over. It's finished. I'm out. I'm free. Medical? Dentist? Ha! Who likes the dentist? Only if you're married to one, I think you would like one. <laughs> I've got a hygienist where I go to get my tea. I only go, I'm regular. I go every six or seven years to have a checkup. <laughs> well, it costs money now, right? 26 or 27 pounds. So, and I haven't got many teeth left. So I don't feel it's value for money going with my... <laughs> I don't feel that my few tombstones are worth taking along and wasting 10 minutes of somebody's time just saying, OK, 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 E1, B3, sick. <laughs> A, A2, D1. And then the job's done. It's finished. But they gave, they gave me to a hygienist. Now, my hygienist is a very excitable lady. She talks to you like you're three years old. Hello, Mr. George, how are you? Now, open wide. <laughs> Ooh. She looks in your mouth and you think there's a ship sailing past or something like that. Open wide. And then she starts poking. Ooh, look at, ooh, ooh, look at, look at this. Well, I'd rather not thank you. She just hooked it out of behind my teeth somewhere. Look at this. Now, I want to introduce you to these little brushes. <laughs> these little yellow br Have you got those yellow brushes at home? They're like small toilet brushes, right? Very, <laughs> very small ones. These little brushes. Now, now, you remember, she's talking to a, a, a pensioner. I've been around a few years. Now, you take these, 
And what you do is you push them between your teeth like this. And you work it from side to side up. My idea getting out of there is like getting free from prison. <laughs> She's a very nice lady. I'm sure somebody likes her. But it's finished. The sense of achievement. When Jesus spoke these words, and we're going to read it again. We read it in the first service. I'm going to get, have you found it yet? John 19, verse 28. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty, a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. That is one of the most important declarations in history. Hello? That is one of the most important declarations in all of history. The whole of time in this world has been devoted to God working out his plan of redemption, bringing back men and women from sin and death and hell back into relationship with himself. And Good Friday is when we remember, and we don't need to be morbid today, by the way, we recognize that Jesus suffered, he bled, he died, he laid down his life, he gave up his spirit, he suffered agony, pain, his blood was shed, his body was broken. For you and for me, it was agonizing. Crucifixion was a horrendous way to die. It was an agonizing death, and he didn't deserve it. But it was for the joy set before him that the Bible says he endured the cross. Because of today, I want to tell you, Jesus is rejoicing today on this Good Friday. Some people are going to church with their heads down and crying, and they've still got Jesus on the cross. Jesus is not on the cross anymore. If you're wearing a crucifix around your neck with Jesus on the cross, go and buy another cross. Because he's not there. He's not on the cross. I'm sorry, it may be an heirloom or whatever, but it's not, it's not a good reminder. We remember a cross that's empty because the one who hung and suffered and bled and died there was buried, and on the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he's alive today. For the joy, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy. I never understand fully why a woman wants to have a baby. And when she's got it, I never understand why she keeps it. <laughs> that part was a joke. <laughs> Having a baby, the first time we had a baby, Pam was there. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was not happy about what I'd put her through. The second time we had a baby, it was Good Friday. I felt more comfortable that day because I got coffee and hot cross buns, <laughs> the real ones. But when women have a baby, I'm sure it's for the joy set before them. When we bring children into the world, it's for the joy set before us. All those little joys that you have on the morning when you get ready for school, they're all joys. How do you, they're joys, remember, don't shout at them. When they're not washing up and tidying, they're joys, don't complain to them. For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. Now friends, the Bible contains the whole story. And this verse in John's Gospel finishes the story. The redemption of mankind comes to this day. In Genesis, we read the story of creation. God creates the, the, the heavens and the earth, all that's in it. He creates it all. He makes it perfect, and he crowns it all with Adam and Eve, and he puts man in the Garden of Eden. And then the serpent comes and tempts the woman. The woman sins. By the way, the woman sinned, and then the garden was hard work after that. So if you put your wife in the garden, I think there's a little bit of balance there. 
All right? So I went down like a lead balloon, didn't it? <laughs> With all the women. All the men are quietly nodding, but making sure the wife's sitting in front of them or alongside them. Sin came into the world. And from that moment, God declared to Satan, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. He was promising Jesus was coming. He was promising the Savior. And all the way through the Old Testament, the prophets are speaking and talking about Jesus coming, how it will be, what will happen, and so many verses that we have that talk about so that the Scripture might be fulfilled. All the way through the Bible, it's leading up to this day. If you open and crack the Bible open at any point, you will find that every story points towards this. Every event points to this. Every prophet points to this. It is God bringing about redemption story. And when we come to Good Friday, when we come to the crucifixion, we come to the cross, we find that the job is done. It's about God's plan for mankind being completed. The spiritual battle to defeat, defeat sin, death, and Satan is over because God said, the one who comes to bring division between your seed and her seed will crush your head. And on Good Friday, Jesus crushed the head of the devil because he died. He was the only one who was able to die for your sin and my sin. You see, throughout the Old Testament, the whole principle was blood for sacrifices. The only way you could get sin, forgiveness for sin was through sacrifices. And of course, you sin again and you have to sacrifice again. Right in the beginning, when Adam and Eve saw their nakedness, the Bible says God slew an animal and made skins for them. Blood sacrifices started from the moment they sinned. But that was not enough. It was not sufficient. And so what we find is that Jesus becomes the fulfillment of that once and for all. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was pierced for your sin and my sin. He died on the cross to complete God's work of bringing, making it possible for you to come back into relationship with himself. Every time a person sinned, a new blood sacrifice needed to be made, but Jesus was the perfect sacrifice who takes away sin, our sins completely, once and for all. So today, Good Friday, we've come together not to be morbid, We've come together and rejoiced, and I, I, these days I, I, I have a seat at the back. I sit near the back. Somebody's in my seat keeping it warm today. But I sit at the back usually on a Sunday, and you don't get the volume of the singing from there. But today, as I've sat here, I've heard people sing their hearts out. I, I almost thought I was at a football match. Holy! Holy, holy. Why not? If we can shout for Liverpool, Milton Keynes Dons won today, by the way, 5-0. I'm not a supporter, but the boys are all talking about it in the back room. It's finished, 5-0. But we were singing today and worshiping the Lord and praising the Lord. And John has reminded us from the scriptures, heaven is rejoicing today. This is not a day for morbidity. This is not a day for Jesus on the cross. This is a day to remember it is finished. It has been done. It is done. When it was all completed, the verse says in verse 28, when it was completed and the scripture, was, that the scripture might be fulfilled, one more needed to be fulfilled. They offered up the drink to Jesus. He took it and then he gave up his spirit after he said, it is finished. I don't know. I don't know how it sounded. But he's dying on the cross. I'm sure he wasn't shouting, It is finished! I'm sure it was, It is finished. He exhaled his last breath as he gave up his spirit and spoke those words. But he did that because he loves you and he loves me. And he went to that cross to die. And I want to give you an opportunity today to make room for him in your life book of Romans says that through one man's mistake, many became guilty. But through one man's greatness, many 
were made good. Now, Jesus, our Savior, died on the cross for you, for me. We used to sing a song, he was nailed to the cross for me. On the cross crucified, for me he died. He was nailed to the cross for me. There's only one sin that can't be forgiven. That's the sin of refusing to receive Jesus. When the Holy Spirit touches your heart, when the message of the gospel comes to you, and you hear that you need Jesus, and you reject him, that's the only sin for which there's no forgiveness. Today I'm calling you, because Jesus is calling you. I'm calling you to come to the cross where he suffered and bled and died and say to him, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm asking you to forgive me. I want to turn from my sin and I'm asking you to give me a brand new start. Give me your strength to live for you, to live a life that honors you and glorifies you. Let's bow our heads a moment as we come to a close. As we close our eyes, bowing our heads, I want to ask you today, you who know that you need Jesus, just where you are, as an indication to me before I pray, raise your hand on this Good Friday showing me that you need Jesus. Be bold, be brave. Have the courage of your convictions. Thank you. Thank you. Raise your hand right up. I need Jesus. I need Jesus in my life. He died for you. He died to make it possible for you to have your sins forgiven and come into a relationship with God through him. If you've not raised your hand yet, raise it now. As we pray, you pray this prayer from your heart, not in parrot fashion, but make it your prayer sincerely from the heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for giving your life. You didn't deserve to die. You were the spotless Lamb of God, but you gave your life to satisfy the requirement that shed blood is what forgives sin. Because you were without sin, you can forgive all our sins for the whole of time. Father, you've accepted the offering of Jesus. Now accept the offering of my heart. Please cleanse my heart. Make me new inside. Give me a new beginning. Help me to know you better. Help me to walk with you day by day and talk with you and grow as a Christian, somebody who will honor your name, somebody who will be a good witness for you. We pray and ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Remember, it is finished. Let's say it together. It is finished. Amen. God bless you.